I actually changed my mind about how we're going to do the PHP quiz. Um, instead of posting it online, um, we're just going to take it now. So everyone get out a sheet of paper and I'll put, no, I'm April Fool's, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 was, I was surprised I didn't like get any dirty looks, so that's good, I guess. You, you feel that you're prepared enough where it wouldn't be that big a deal. Maybe, maybe that's it, or, or you you didn't want to, um, you know, you have a good poker face. Maybe I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, today. We are going to, the, the, the PHP quiz will be available um, later today, and it will be, um, you'll have like a week to do it. It'll be, be similar to, um, similar to um, the, uh, the JavaScript quiz. All right. We, we talked a little bit about Ajax last time, and of course, if, Brittany comes in late, you guys are going to have to go along with me that we already have the quiz. <laughs> we talked a, a little bit about Ajax last time, and to put it up in our diagram that I always draw, we talked about the client connecting to the internet, making a request to a server, the server may be interacting with a database or other stuff. The client makes a request that gets mapped to the server. The server responds back with a web page. A request and a response. The request is in the form of a URL plus maybe something on the query string plus maybe something from a form that's not on the query string plus other information, for example, the IP address of the computer that's making the request. And the server typically can use that to figure out uh, at least approximately where uh, the person is located. The server takes all this and does whatever it needs to do. Again, it depends on the context. For some things, the location doesn't really matter, right? So if you are bidding on something on eBay, um, the location probably doesn't matter. Uh, it might, actually, if, if it showed international things, but we'll say it doesn't matter. Facebook, it probably doesn't matter. But for some things, like a Google search, it does matter. So like if you search for restaurants, it will show you restaurants within your area. At any rate, it responds with a web page that consists of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, some mix of those things. The server-side script actually is used to write the page, assuming we're using server-side scripting. This diagram and this diagram, we're, we're focusing on dynamic pages and not static pages. So the server-side script actually dynamically writes the web page. In other words, it takes all these parameters, it takes stuff maybe from a database, and it puts it all together, and it comes up with a response. A response that is uh, distinct for that specific request. And that's what really makes the web more than just like some online brochures, right? Um, static web pages look the same for everyone. You can do some cool things with them, to be sure. But really, the power of the web, and the power of the web is being like applications that are online, like Angel or eBay or a banking application or whatever, is that the server can give a response geared specifically to you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I actually changed uh, my mind, and we had a pop quiz at the beginning of class for the PHP. No, I'm just... Yeah, it was. Yeah, I, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. April, April Fools. Um, all right. So, 
The server can make a page and make a response specific to the person. Once the response gets over, then we can use JavaScript to tweak the appearance of the page, to make small changes to the page. So in the regular standard traditional model, we could say the server side script is used to create the page. And the client side script, server side side, server side script, and the client side script is used to manipulate a completed page without going back to the server. That is like the kind of scenarios that we've done so far in this class. All right. Now, in Ajax, the first part of the initial request for a page typically looks the same. So when you go to Google, the same thing happens. Your initial time of loading up the Google page. You're requesting from Google. Google sends back. Um, a mix of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Then, however, once we start interacting with the page, we are interacting in a different way. In other words, we're making two different kinds of requests to Google, and I'll bring it up on the, uh, on the computer in a minute. There's our first request, where we first request a page, and we get the page back. That is like all the kinds of requests that we've studied so far in this class. I request a page, boom, it comes back. Once I have that page delivered, though, and I start typing in the text box to do a Google search, and it starts looking up in the database what the most common search terms are for what I've typed in, I'm now in a different territory. All right? We'll call this the initial request. We can also make another kind of request. And that request is made through JavaScript. All right? In other words, it's not made with a submit button, and it's not made by typing in the URL in the address bar. We have, through JavaScript, we're going to make a request. And this is a different kind of request. It's not a request for an entire web page, like this request. This is an HTTP request. All right, if you notice on the address bar, when you go to a web page, typically it says HTTP colon Google dot whatever. That's the kind of request that you're making. This is called an XML HTTP request. We'll talk about what XML means in a bit, maybe not today, but some point in the future. And, but the, and the name of this is a little misleading because you're not always getting, it's not always, XML is not always involved here. But that's the name of it, so that's what we'll call it. So the XML HTTP request isn't a request for a complete page. It's still going to use a URL, and we still may, may pass things from the query string, on the query string. But it's a request for a piece of data. When the client gets that piece of data, the client formats the data to change the page. So, I go to Google. I initially make one of these requests. The server sends me back the Google home page, so I'm looking at it. I start typing in. At this point, I'm making this kind of request. I'm making a different kind of request. 
It's not triggered by a submit. It's not triggered by me typing in the URL. It's triggered by that there's JavaScript when I press the key down. There's JavaScript that says, after I've typed in a letter in the, in the, the search box, make a request to the server of this type, an XML HTTP request. That's going to go to the server. The server is going to respond, not with an entire page. So we don't have to redraw the entire page. We're just getting back a piece of data. In the case of Google, we're getting back the top, whatever, four or five search terms. And then the JavaScript updates the page to show the new data. All right? That's kind of the schematic of how this works. Let's look at Google again to refresh our memory for that. And then we'll move on. in the address bar and I type in google.com. Actually, I don't visibly see it, but actually before it is http colon google.com. All right. I'm making an http request. What is an http request? It's a request for a complete web page. And that's what I get back. Now, Google is going to go and do its thing. It actually does do some server-side processing. For example, if it knows I'm in Germany, it gives me google.de. If it knows that I am in uh, um, the UK, it gives me google.co.uk. If I'm logged into Google, it'll show my username and it might show if I've got an email or something like that. I forget. But assuming I'm not logged in, which I'm not, I type that in. This is an HTTP request. A request for a whole web page. This is just like going to lccc.com. I'm just requesting a web page and getting back a response. So, so far, we have not done anything different. We've just done the traditional sort of web page where I make a request, I get back a whole web page. And part of that web page could be JavaScript. Here's where the fun starts. As I start typing in letters in here, All right. I see the most common search terms for the particular character string. Now again, we can tell just by thinking this through that something different is happening. All right. Because there's no flicker of the screen. Notice that if you go and request a page I'm just hitting refresh over and over again. You notice down here it says that, you know, waiting for Google.com, you get an update on the status bar, the screen flickers a little bit. Again, depending on your connection, that may be more or less obvious. Whereas in here, it's seamless. I don't see a flicker. I don't see anything up on the status bar. And yet, I can assume that the client side isn't doing all the work here. I can assume that because this looks an awful lot like some sort of database interactivity. That somewhere on Google there is some mechanism that keeps track of what words, what terms get searched for. All right. And as we type in, 
it seems like we're asking the server for those terms, which we are. How are we doing it? We're doing it via JavaScript, and we're doing it via an XML HTTP request. Now again, how do I trigger this? How do I set the ball in motion? Again, it's, it's JavaScript, so I do it with user events. In this case, it's on key up, probably. There's actually a couple of methods, on key down and on key up, so that you can, you can trap those. So on key up is after I finish typing the character, then it's going to take that, run out to the server, ask for the four top search terms, get the answer back, then it's going to reformat the page. All right. Questions about this so far? Again, when I talk about AJAX, I'm not talking about a programming language. I'm talking about a style of coding. I'm, I'm talking about the, the manner in which the client and server interact. All right. So, I don't know for sure what language Google uses. I could Google it. <laughs> so Google might use PHP. Probably not. I mean, PHP, well, I don't know. They, they could be using it, I suppose. They could be using Perl. They could be using ASP.NET, although I don't think so. They could be using some sort of Java or whatever. All right? You don't know. But again, it doesn't matter. AJAX doesn't relate to the specific language that's used on the server. It relates to the manner in which the client and the server interact. So there's only one language for client-side manipulation, and that's JavaScript. So we know the client side's running JavaScript. The server side could be running anything, any server-side language, and they all have the mechanism that they all can handle this, and they all can deal with it. All right. Let's write down the main steps. We're going to go over an example in a couple minutes here, but prior to that, let's define the steps that we're going to see. And any AJAX coding is going to fit this template one way or another. All right. First of all, we're going to have, we're going to create a request object. This all happens on the client side. Within AJAX, most of the work happens on the client side. All right? Client side is responsible for a lot of the work. The server side really has a reduced role. Its job is no longer to give me a complete web page, but just give me a chunk of data. All right? On the client side, we create a request object. We can think of that as a pipeline between the client and the server. We're going to use that object to send a request to the server. We're going to use that object to get the answer back from the server. All right. So we'll make the request via that object we'll get the response via that object. So we're going to create one of these. Now, here's the thing. All right? There are slight variations in which how you create this object depending on the browser you're using. So we're going to have a function that does this. And that function is going to be, um, is going to have some browser specific code. Here's a good thing about that. This is code that you get down once and you really don't worry about it. All right, you can put it in an include file if you're doing PHP. All right. Second thing is, is this object is going to be pretty important to our page, so we're going to make it a global variable. 
I think I said last time that you avoid global variables, and that's true. But it's justified in this case because this request is so integral to AJAX operating that we want to have this available throughout our entire web page. So that's the first thing that we do within our client side page. So we create this object. Step two is, and this is very similar to just plain old JavaScript, we have a user event that initiates some action. And we had that with plain old JavaScript, right? You put your mouse over something, a menu appears. So a user event. A user does something, page responds in a certain way. In this case, however, the user event is going to trigger an XML HTTP request to be made. So, that action is going to involve formatting the request. And we'll see concrete examples of this in uh, five minutes or so. So we format the request. We get the request ready to make to the server. All right. We provide what's called a callback function. The A in AJAX stands for asynchronous. Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. All right. The A in AJAX stands for asynchronous. Asynchronous means not at the same time. All right. If we're having a phone conversation, that would be a synchronous conversation. In other words, if I were to call David on the phone, I'd say, hello, David, and say, hello, Mike. All right? So in other words, I say something, he responds back immediately, then I say the next thing, then he responds, and it's synchronous. We're synchronized, right? If, it, if the conversation is going to work, we're not hopefully both talking at the same time. I'm saying something. Then he responds immediately. Then I say the next thing. That's a synchronous. Well, JavaScript is asynchronous. A as a prefix means not, you know. So that would be more like a voicemail message. In other words, let's say I call David and he doesn't answer his phone, but instead I leave a voicemail. Hey, David. Um, I have a question about the lab that you turned in. All right. Am I going to hang up then? Probably not. I'm probably going to say, when you get a minute, give me a call at and give my callback number. The number that I want to be contacted at. All right. And then David, when he gets an opportunity, he'll call back and give his response. All right. So that's asynchronous. In other words, he doesn't have to be sitting by his phone. Also, I don't have to be sitting by my phone either. I can be off doing things. And when I see I have a voicemail message back, all right, then I can listen to it and, and deal with it and process with it. In Ajax, it's the same sort of thing. It's an asynchronous request, which means I'm the client makes a request says how to contact it back by giving a function, then the client could do other things. When the client gets notified of the response, then it can deal with the response. All right? So in the phone analogy, whatever David's message was, I could go and do something about it. All right? In the case of Ajax, the response is going to be in the form of a chunk of data from the server. And the client then can do something with that chunk of data. So, the third part is client gets notified. of 
response does something with it. And typically it's like we saw in the Google example. Doing something with it means changing the page, taking that new data that it got from the server and somehow formatting it and displaying it on the page. All right, so that's what we mean by doing something with it. Now this is on the client side. So you see, we're putting a lot more functionality on the client side. In our traditional model, we, the client didn't have to worry about anything. Client made a request to the server, the server went and returned back an entire web page. The server's job becomes easier. The server's job is when it gets a request, process request, and return data. That's why if you notice most books that talk about Ajax, the focus is on the client side. Why? Because the server side just does what it normally does, right? That's what a server does, is it takes a request and responds to it. All right. The only difference being that in the case of an AJAX request, the response is not a complete web page, but it's just some data. All right. So if anything, the server has an easier job because it's not responsible for creating a web page. It's just responsible for sending back some data. The client then has the responsibility of taking that data and formatting it and displaying it the way that it wants to. This is our roadmap. I'm going to refer to this as we go through our example. All right. Do any of you guys have Huffman for a class? You should think of a good April Fool's joke for him. We have to find someone that's in his class. I actually have two examples here. We'll see how far we get with those today. All right, so I'm putting my pages in CI NetPub WW root, which is my web server's root directory. And I have, the first example is to do a conversion Fahrenheit to centigrade, one of my absolute favorite examples for I don't know why. That would be a shame if the United States ever goes to centigrade, right, or Celsius, because I won't be able to do this example anymore. I have to do it between centigrade and Kelvin. Kelvin is used in scientific calculations, so... I guess that's my fallback plan. All right, so I type in localhost slash conversion.html. And I get a form. See, I'm already ready for it. I have degrees Kelvin, too. So I put in 12 degrees centigrade, and I tab out of the field. I could have a button here, but I'm using a tab out. 12 degrees centigrade is 53 degrees Fahrenheit, 285 degrees Kelvin. If I put something else in... 100 degrees centigrade, 212. Again, notice there's no flicker at all. It's not like the whole page is refreshing. Just this little area is getting changed. All right? Just this little area is getting changed. All right? 
And I could have done this with a button, but just for variety, I made it so that when you tab out of the field, um, it, it does it. I don't know, just for demonstration purposes. When you uh, talk about tab out, I mean, you're talking literally anywhere else on the screen or the tab key itself? Uh, literally go anywhere else. So if I type in 111 and I go up to the address bar, Typically what people do is, like with a form, like assuming there were more fields on this form, you would tab to get to the next field. All right. So let's go and look at the code. We're going to spend most of our time looking at the client code. Why? Because the server code does next to nothing. All right. Now, again, that's not the case in all AJAX applications, right? The Google... Um, AJAX code that looks at what you've typed in and does a database query to determine that that's doing some work all right but in this simple example the work isn't that extensive okay notice this var is declared outside of the script outside of a function I'm sorry it's, it's within a script tag but it's outside of the function what does it make that variable then? Global. A global variable, right? That means that, again, remember the subtle difference between how PHP and JavaScript handles global variables. By declaring it outside of any function, this is a global variable, which means that I can use it in any other function. I'm going to use that in these other functions. So HTTP is the name of my pipeline. It's the name of my request object. How do I create it? I create it this way. By calling a function that says create request object. I'm pretty sure, even though this is an older function, that this still works. All right? That would be something to test on the newest version of Internet Explorer to see if the Internet Explorer did something to... to mess this up. But this code you can use pretty much verbatim. I guess you, you know you could look to see if there was an update to it. I'm sure online there's some resources. And what this does is this looks to see what browser you're running by looking at one of the objects in the DOM, the app name of the browser, and it creates either this way or this way the request object. In either case, it returns the request object and the HTTP variable gets set to whatever this returns. So this function, create request object, is like a little factory that turns out request objects. And that little factory is smart enough to know how to create the request object depending on what kind of browser you use. I'm actually curious to see if Internet Explorer will work here. Sure, hoping it does. Sure enough, it does. All right. So at least through whatever version of Internet Explorer we have installed on this machine, that function still works. This is a good function because it's a black box, right? What do I mean by a black box? I could put this on any page. This doesn't depend on anything specific to the page. I call this function, it looks to see what browser I'm running and returns my request object. So I could put this off in an include file if I wanted to and be done with it and just know the name of the function and it's going to give me a request object. This line of code, because it's not in a function, is going to fire off when the browser gets to it. So right off the bat, when this page loads, I have in my variable HTTP a request object. And it's a request object that was created properly for the type of browser that I'm running. I don't have to worry about browsers anymore. All right? I just need to create that pipeline. 
you know, um, it would be like, you know, do, do, does your does your device require USB or USB mini? All right. Once you got the right plug, the rest works the same. All right. So once you have the right plug here, once you have that right object, that right pipeline, the rest of the code works the same. All right. So that's the first part, creating the request object. Second part. I have an onChange method. When does an onChange method get fired off? When something changes. Change of focus. Yeah, I was going to say the, the, the two things taken together, actually. When the value changed and you leave the field. So in other words, notice that as I'm typing in, it hasn't called the function. All right. When I leave the field, that's the tabbing out. Now, it's going to be impossible to tell here, but if I go into the field and leave the field, the on change event does not fire off. All right, which makes sense here. If, if I've already had that value in there, there's no need I need to recompute it. There's no need for me to recompute it. So the on change event fires off when I leave the field and there's a different value than when I went into the field. All right, now we could change this to be on the on key down event or on key up event would be the appropriate one. And maybe we'll do that if we have time today. So that way, as I'm typing in, it will do the conversion. All right. So on change, I'm calling temp, and I'm uh, compiling convert temp, rather, and I'm passing this dot value. Keep in mind, I could do this any number of ways. All right. What does this dot value represent? A number of students get confused with the word this. I actually had a person in my iPhone class ask about self, which is the same thing as this. It usually refers to the, uh, the immediate page or immediate function. Okay, you're kind of on the right track. What were you saying? Exactly. In other words, in this case, this, the expression this.value is part of the text box tag. All right? Therefore, this in, it's hard to, it's hard to phrase this without using this a couple of times. All right? This in this context means a text box, all right? Because this on change event is part of the text box. So if I say this dot value, I mean the value of the text box, all right? If I use this somewhere else, I could mean a value of a global variable or a value of a drop down or something like that, all right? So it's always within context, and this refers to the specific object that that statement is part of. So in other words, when the function changes, I'm call or I'm sorry, when the text box changes, I'm calling convert temperature and I'm giving it the value of the text box. So I look up here, convert temperature, arg temp. All right, so we've added our user event that initiates something that happens. So changing the value in the text box initiates this function. What does this function do? This function does two things. 
or three things. There's three instructions. I guess it makes sense it does three things, right? First thing the instruction does is it uses the pipeline to format the request. So HTTP uh, dot open is I'm formatting the request. The request is using get, which is just like with a form, right? I'm going to pass the values on the query string. What script do I want to call? The script I want to call is called convert.php. This is a lot like the action of a form. What do I want to pass on the query string? I want to pass the temperature. So my request includes a question mark, the word temp equals, and then the value of my argument. All right. So the value of my argument is what? The value of the text box. Yes? If we were passing in multiple arguments, would you just use the comment would be common assigned to? No, if we, if we were passing multiple uh, arguments, it would be an ampersand. So if there was something else, I would do ampersand. Something like that. And so on both sides, there's a little plus sign? Yes, because remember, the plus sign is concatenating a string. All right? I'm saying I want this string plus the contents of that variable plus this string plus the contents of that variable. All right? So I have a chain of hard-coded string plus the value of a variable, plus another hard-coded string, plus the value of a variable, and so on. All right. What do you suppose this does? If you want a hint of what that does, look on line 30 or just pay attention to the name of the function. It defines a function and handles the response. This is what I described as a callback function. This is like the, vo the number I leave on David's voicemail. David, this is what I want. This is my request to you to do this. When you have an answer, call me back at this number, okay? Except this isn't a phone number, all right? I'm, I assumed you all realize that, all right? It's the name of a function. So when the server does its thing, because I don't know what else the server's doing. Just like if I call David, I don't know what else he's doing. He could be busy or whatever. But when the server gets around to processing my request, all right, this function is going to get called. All right. So I formatted my request. I've defined the answer, uh, or not the answer, but, but the function is going to handle the answer from the server. And then this is a Captain Jean-Luc Picard, make it so. All right. This actually initiates the request. Here we're just sort of setting things up. Here we're actually saying go out and do that request. The client, then, doesn't do anything until it gets a response. This handle response method actually gets called several times. All right? And again, I, I don't remember the actual values. I'll have to Google it. Here are the values. All right. Zero means that the request hasn't started yet. 
One means that the request is connected to the server. Two means that the server has received the request. Three means that the server is processing the request. Four is the most important one, that the request has been finished and the response is ready. All right. Now, in many cases, we're only interested in the status of four. All right. But if I was making a long request, a request that took the server a little bit of time, I might be interested in those other fields. So I could update the user and say, OK, connection established, request received, processing request, boom, here's your answer. Whereas in this particular case, it's such a simple request that there would really be no need to do that. It would just flash one, two, three, four, and boom, there's your answer. All right. So here, I am looking for, this is a callback method. This gets called every time the status changes. I'm only interested in when the status is 4, however. So when the status is 4, it means that the server has done its thing. Where is the result? The result is, in this case, in a field called response text. Remember, that pipeline, that HTTP object, is a pipeline between the client and the server. The request goes through that object, the response comes back to it. How do we make the request? We make it this way. How do we get the result? Well, in this case, we get the result in the variable response text. Now, in this example, I am getting the, the, the temperature in Fahrenheit and Kelvin. So there's two parts of my result. And those, those parts are separated by commas. So I'm going to split my response text using a comma, and I'll get an array. All right? The first element of the array is going to be Fahrenheit, I suppose. The second part is going to be Kelvin. What do I do then? Well, I need to update these sections on my page. So I have a section for Fahrenheit, a section for Kelvin. How do I update the content of a particular area of the web page? I use the inner, L, inner HTML property to set to result 0, result 1. So, what's my response going to look like? It's going to look like the Fahrenheit value, a comma, the Kelvin value. I do the split function that gets rid of the comma and splits that response into an array. However many commas are in the response will determine how many elements are in the array. If there's one comma, there's going to be two elements in the array. If there's three commas, there'll be four elements in the array. And then I take and I take the part of the response and I set the inner HTML of the appropriate area. Okay, so we took 10, 15 minutes to go over this part of it. Let's look at what the server does. That'll take 30 seconds probably. Again, what name? What's the name of the script? Convert.php. What are we passing it? We're passing the temperature in a query string variable called temp. So let's look at convert.php. All we do is we grab the value of the query string. We convert to Fahrenheit. We convert to Kelvin. And then we output the Fahrenheit amount a comma, and the Kelvin amount. Now that, instead of getting displayed on the web page, it gets put in that response text variable. And then the client can take that and break it down and display it. Now on the server side part of it, mm -hmm. yeah, print, but it would also
supposed to be acceptable yeah. if you use return? Not return. Not return. All right, because this isn't a function that's being called. This is in the main line. Essentially, what we want to do is we want to output to the client. And how do you output to the client? Print or what I thought you were going to ask, echo. Right, but not return. Return, return. Return does not return a value to the client. Return returns the value to whoever called the function. And in this case, it's not like the client is call. The client, in one respect, calls this, but it doesn't call it like a function. So return would not work. All right. Now things will get more complicated, right? We could return more data than this. All right. But the basics of this apply. We're always going to create a request object because that request object is needed to be the pipeline. We're always going to have some user interaction that triggers some JavaScript. The client is always going to format the request. It needs to know what script it's going to call. It needs to know what data it needs to pass. The client is also going to define the callback function. Who is handling the result? The client is going to make the request. The server just does its thing and outputs the, outputs the answer, the response. The client then takes that response based on the status of the ready state. When it gets the ready state of four, it has a response and it does whatever it needs to do with it. In the case of Google, what does it do? Well, it puts a little box up there. Um, showing the most popular search terms. In this particular case, what does it do? Well, we output to the page in the inner HTML the value for Fahrenheit and the value for Kelvin. Next week, what I will do is I will go over this again, go over the model again, and I will focus on debugging. In other words, this is all well and good if this works, right? What if it doesn't work? How do you troubleshoot it? So what I'll do is I'll look at some things that you can do, some steps you can do to make sure that, you know, to make sure that things are working the way that you'd expect them to, all right? And we'll review some troubleshooting techniques, all right? We'll do that on Monday. Monday, by the way, I will not be in lab. I'll post an announcement to Angel, but I will not be in lab on Monday. All right, just as a fair warning. All right, we'll see you in lab. I uh, was curious. Uh, obviously, uh -huh. you're using kind of the, the JavaScript to kind of funnel that information yep. over to the server side of We have someone who disables that JavaScript. Then it doesn't work. And ideally, your page should still work, but with limited, with less functionality. So, for example, let's imagine, I'm not going to do it, but let's imagine I have disabled JavaScript when I go to Google. and I start typing in, what if JavaScript was disabled? Well, it wouldn't pop up there. I'd have to type my whole search string in and then go and do it. In other words, I would think that if I turned off JavaScript here, I would still be able to Google stuff. I don't get that extra functionality, to be sure, all right, but that's the cost of, of enabling uh, or disabling JavaScript. There is a no script tag that you can put. Um, and for example, in, in this case, if I wanted to provide an alternative, I could put a no script tag, have a submit button that would send maybe to a different server side script that would display the result. So you're absolutely right. You have to, as a designer, then have to make that call do you simply shrug your shoulders and say, sorry, bud, you're out of luck? 
or do you make sure there's at least a reasonable alternative? 